My name is Rhonda Asarch, and I am here with Pete Martinez at the Boca Raton Historical Society on September 6, 2012, to interview him for the IBM Oral History Project. Mr. Martinez, if you would start off with, where are you from originally, and when did you arrive in Boca Raton? I was born in Cuba. We came to the United States in 1961. I had the great opportunity to live the American dream of studying hard, working hard. Uh, came to Boca Raton right out of the University of Miami. I was uh, humbled and uh, given the tremendous opportunity to work for IBM. I started with IBM in 1975 uh, and moved to Boca in 1976. And when you were at the University of Miami, what specifically was your degree? I studied electrical engineering, and uh, back then, the notion of computers was a very, very remote uh, area. Actually, very few uh, education programs offered courses in computers. So the opportunity to interview with IBM was very much of a challenge because I had no idea what a computer was, much less what they would do but yet a little bit of the background and an awful lot of the, uh, the enthusiasm, the energy somehow came through in the interview. And uh, 32 years later, um, uh, we had uh, done some pretty amazing things within the company. So when you started with IBM, what exactly was your title and what were your responsibilities? I was a junior engineer, which is a starting level for um, engineering position. I was given right away the opportunity to design parts of mini computers. Mini computers was the predecessor to a lot of the personal computers that we know today. So they were kind of mid-range systems. But I was thrown right into the challenge of designing uh, with very little design experience, certainly in computers. I had done some work through my college time uh, in, uh, in design, but primarily in office building design and power systems and such. So what was fascinating is the opportunity that IBM throws you into, the educational system that provides you all of the background to come up to speed very quickly, and then the mentoring of some of the more senior engineers that they will literally take you under their wing and bring you up with them. At no point in time did you feel completely inadequate for the job, m completely different. You felt very challenged and very pumped about what, uh, what the task was at stake. Enormous responsibility because when you are involved in a design, the, the, the responsibility both financially and time-wise to the corporation is massive. You've got to get it right the first time. So uh, it's a job and a responsibility to take very seriously, and it develops some incredibly value, uh, strong values for, uh, for your life, for your career. When you say mini computers, are you talking about a specific project at IBM or like the desktops that we have today, the laptops? Could you expand on that a little bit? Sure. It was the Series 1 which was not announced at the time in 1975 when I, uh, when I started. It was actually announced in 1976. I had the opportunity to work on some of the processor units, the CPU, the central processing units, for uh, that series of, of mini computers. The product was announced as a family of products in 1976 in November. And to this date, some of those computers are still operating at places like State Farm and Kmart and some of the very, very large uh, enterprises around. Many people don't know what they do, <laughs> but they dare not turn them off. <laughs> okay. You mentioned a mentor. Do you remember who your first mentor was and what he or she was like? Mm -hmm. My first mentor was a uh, senior engineer called Verge Wyatt. Verge had been the consummate IBMer in terms of tremendous background experience, but somebody that had a passion for the profession and very, very willing to give up their time and their energy to bring folks along. He was tough, 
but he was very enthusiastic about the development of the team. We had a group of five uh, junior engineers, all incredibly, incredibly charged up, all with uh, very uh, high aspirations. And Verge had a very unique uh, means to, uh, to keep it under control. <laughs> So enthusiasm was encouraged at IBM. Um, what else was the culture like at IBM? Knowing that it was a next generation of engineers that were coming up, uh, there was an awful lot of enthusiasm, not only for the intellectual and the professional work that we were doing, but the work outside or the, the time outside of work. So we actually developed an awful lot of softball teams we had the beer games on Saturdays. We had an awful lot of uh, parties and celebrations. So uh, it developed a very, very strong unified culture where these people to this day, 30 some years later, we still have very strong bonds and relationship and we, we look back to those times. Uh, the, the important thing it was tremendous loyalty to the company, tremendous loyalty that we felt from the company to us and a place that where we were there for the long haul. At no point in time were we suspect to some of the uh, job hunting, shopping that you, you see today. It was a completely different feeling, which is you, you were in it for, for life because it was that much of a uh, entity and there was so much different variety of opportunities within IBM that you could say you could see a long-term career, and I did. What was one of the first challenges that you faced when you came to IBM? Not having a background on computers, it was actually completely humbling because uh, when I got my first design uh, assigned to me, I, uh, I literally had no idea what was up to. And so at that point in time, uh, you actually dig deep and he said, look, we've been challenged many times before in my, uh, my life and this is just another one of them. Uh, fortunately, it was within IBM and their resources, both in terms of talent and the educational capabilities and the, 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 the team were so strong that it made that passage very, very well. Five years later, you know, I find myself with a number of designs under the belt and a number of patents uh, and applications and disclosures and such, and you say, wow, what a great testament to a company that can take such a, an uncultivated talent and shape it up so quickly so that it became ready for the next big challenge, which was the personal computer. For, so for five years, I worked on the Series 1, and that set the stage for one of the most amazing projects ever in the history of mankind, which was the IBM Personal Computer. Do you talk a little bit about that project? Sure. The IBM Personal Computer was a fascinating story. It was in the time that there was an awful lot of small computers being used as toys, as uh, sandbox type of, of projects. And IBM developed a small group to actually study that market, to actually study what are the technologies are about, is there a market for it, are there possibilities, should IBM even be considering any of this. A very small group was set up in Atlanta that actually studied the market, and then a, a development team was set up in Boca Raton. It was an experiment. It was absolutely an experiment, but co closely knitted and sponsored by the CEO of the company, which gave an awful lot of uh, permissiveness to actually develop a lot of the innovation that would re be required to participate in this market. The original forecast for the IBM PC was somewhere around 120,000 units worldwide. We missed by a little bit. A but <laughs> but the, the, the innovation went well beyond the product itself. It was the way that it was done that was so magnificent because in essence, it was a new product developed in record time 
tested in a completely different way from what IBM typically did, developed from parts that were off the shelf from different manufacturers, so they had very, very little IBM components within it. The software was not IBM's. We manufactured in record time, which was completely unheard of, and we sold through channels such as Sears. That's the first time an IBM product had ever be, was sold through a retail channel. So if you look at the number of firsts that had to be accomplished in order to put together such a, a miracle in such a short period of time, it was incredible. And it was a, an era of tremendous, tremendous uh, pride, determination, and just incredible dedication from, from the people because the, the, everybody was on a mission. It was like a cult. I mean, it was us against the world in the sense that we were going to prove something completely different. Now, we had no idea of where this thing was going to go, but we knew that we were working on something very, very special. When the market starts picking up and there's some recognition of it, we were as impressed and as surprised as anybody else because we were heads down, you know, working on something that we felt was innovative. We didn't know how innovative it was going to be. But the IBM brand just gave tremendous credibility to the product. Mm -hmm. By the way, the IBM brand also requires tremendous amount of quality, dedication, supervision, and, and, and execution in order to take a, market, a, a product like this out to market. So it was very, very important, but it was one of the things that clearly created a new market, an industry, a revolution across the world. If it wasn't for the personal computer, there would be no internet. Think about that the personal computer became the um, platform for which the internet gets delivered. The internet would still be a communication system between universities. You mentioned um, time components and team. How much time from conception to shelf would you say the, uh, the original IBM PC, we probably did in less than 18 months. And that was uh, unreal. And uh, the, the key parameters were the ability to, one, create a very uh, strong prototype demonstration system, and then bring in a number of partners, business partners, primarily the technology developers and the software developers, to work with us to, to integrate. It was stressful not only for us, but for every other developer because the type of volumes that we were introducing to disk drive manufacturers, memory developers and such, they had never seen any kind of volumes like this before. So all of a sudden, they have to ramp up to meet the demand that we were projecting. So the, the trickle-down effect of, of the creation of the industry was very, very phenomenal. So, you know, the Intels, the Microsofts, the, uh, the, the hard drive manufacturers all had to step up their game. So it really, really pushed and created a number of related industries completely around us. And when you mentioned about components, um, what was different about the components more so with the PC than it was with the standalone computers? Sure. With the PC, what we did was create an open architecture so that we could bring components from the outside. Typically in an IBM design process, you take it through a very, very grueling set of quality standards and testing and, and things. The design cycle is longer, the test cycle is longer, the quality is significantly higher, the risk is significantly lower. Uh, here, because of the time constraints of the market, we did not have the luxury of that full dedication to, to the testing and the quality sourcing and such. There was a larger risk, but that is the industry that we were participating in it was expected to be fast turnover 
and very, very much uh, tested to a different set of parameters. We knew this. We knew it, and we were reminded every day. Uh, one of the, the jobs that I had was managing the systems assurance organization, the test organization for the personal computers. It was a constant debate with the corporation saying, how could you possibly test something in a four-week period? And we said, well, in order to compete in the market, that's what we have to do. Here's what our competitors are doing, and we will do a better job than our competitors, but five years to develop something that is going to be obsolete in six months, it, it, it doesn't cut it. So we give the IBM Corporation tremendous credit for, one, the understanding and being able to accommodate us into a, a significant market like this. Second thing that it did was the number of related products, and that was actually the name of the organization that were created around the personal computer, was an enormous thing. The first thing that it did was start replacing what we used to know as terminals, computer terminals, that you would sit there and click away and everything else. The moment the industry realized that the PC had a lower cost point than those products, and you could do a whole lot more things than just sit on them. You actually could load programs into it, and you had a printer dedicated, and you could de develop a, an office system or a home system. That whole market went to the PC. Then it became cash registers. Then it became automotive systems. Then it became uh, terminals for airlines. Then it became a variety of different things. So. It became the basis for so many other products that were not known necessarily as a personal computer, but the innards of it were exactly that. If you look at some of the, um, the gas pumps that they started becoming automated that you could put your credit card in there, what was in there was a PC. The ATM machine, that was a PC. So over and over and over, you started seeing it completely dispersed through, through an industry. And you've mentioned competitors a couple of times now. Um, if you could um, list who those are and how they reacted to IBM going into this new area. It was fascinating because uh, the traditional folks that we competed to at the low end, what was the mini computers, which was DEC and NCR and, and companies like this, uh, they all started putting their bets down, but they disappeared from the map. Actually, DEC was, is no longer a company. The companies that were in the game, a lot of them had just disappeared as well. I mean, three years after we launched, the competitors that we had were no longer there. These were Commodore, these were Zilog, these were a number of different, you know, startups, Franklin and stuff that just vanished or got absorbed or, or just you know, went out of business. It did create a number of other players. Uh, Apple uh, was there from the beginning, but they were, had a very, very small market, very niche market, a whole lot of emphasis on desktop publishing and the usability and such, but they were like 2% of, of a market back then. And it's primarily because it was a closed proprietary architecture, which was 180 degrees from what we're doing with the PC. We told everybody, look, if you got a card, here's the interface that you test to. If you have software, here's what you write to. Apple was, you know, it's got to be mine and everything else. So they, they maintained the market, but completely disappeared. The phenomenon that happened was one of the better um, validations of the market, which was the whole area of clones. Clones started replicating because it was an open system, because we published our interfaces, because we published our designs, people started replicating our design. Mm -hmm. And they started coming in with some pretty darn good products. Compaq was a perfect example of it. Dell was a perfect example of it. They said, we took your product, we now cost reduced it, we did whatever we had to do. Dell uh, specialized in just-in-time manufacturing, Compaq in the, in the compatibility and then in. So now you had the, the, the prominence of a very different set of product that you created an industry and now they were eating your, your own kids. So it was a fascinating, fascinating work. We tried to out-clone the clones. That's a very difficult uh, thing to do because it's an industry where the margins are so small mm -hmm. that you, the last thing you want to do is get into a price war. So we always try to push on the quality 
perspective, we announced some superior products. The Personal System 2 that we announced in 1986 was a perfect example of that, which was take it up a notch. Our operating systems, the OS 2, was a superior operating system to Microsoft's uh, what became Windows. However, Windows was very much on uh, let's go get the market, our customers will test it for us. Mm -hmm. We had a discipline of, you know, we like to test our own products and make sure that we deliver a quality product and no breakdown. Well, it's fascinating. We actually got to fix a lot of Microsoft bugs where the OS2 actually had a very, very uh, illustrious career was on ATM machines. Those can't go down. <laughs> so it, it had a niche for it, but it was an understanding of a market and the, a lot of credit goes to the Bill Gates of the world that very, very clearly understood his market and clearly understood what it gets in market and the permissiveness of a market to pain, to the pain of the system crashing every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we put up with it, we cursed Bill, but still bought his product. <laughs> um. And you mentioned um, outside developers, of course, Microsoft. Were there others besides Microsoft that helped with the IBM desktop PC? Yeah. Uh, from the software side, there were multiple uh, because it was the emergence of a number of, of different units. Uh, Lotus, mm -hmm. back then. Uh, Oracle was starting to, to play around. Um, uh, uh, with some of the, the application developers uh, started coming up with it. So at the beginning, the simple ones were a word processing, a spreadsheet, and some games that people put on it. And then eventually it started picking up. But the, the main applications were personal computing. The main application was actually on your desktop. It was personal computing, so it wasn't home computing by, by any means, but it was personal. So for us, a measure of stature in the company was when you got your first personal computer. When you got the PC in the desk, they said, ah, he's working on something special. <laughs> okay. Um, you had mentioned um, how the desktop PC or IBM's PC led to the internet. Mm -hmm. What other, and ATM machines, what other world impacts do you see looking back at your time to IBM? Uh, the notion that computing could be done by the individual uh, clearly set a different tone. If you look at the impact right now, it's not only the devices that we take for granted today, like the ATM machines and the, uh, the, uh, the, the gas station, but the phone. The phone actually has become a computer, a very, very sophisticated computer, where it's taken an awful lot of the, the, the guesswork out because of the user interfaces. But if you look at the computing capability and the notion of putting an application running on a processor, that's a personal computer. What it did was make a phone into a computer, not a computer into a phone, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but if you look back in 1992, we had a, um, a project called Simon. Simon was a very, very interesting uh, situation. It was the first time, and this was an IBM project, that we had put a cellular phone with fax capability with messaging capability, with email capability, into something that looked like a brick, okay? It had a screen that had touch sensitive and it had uh, the, the, the recognition and you could talk to this thing and it's a, it was a cell phone, but you could receive email messages and such. That was the birth of the integration of computing and telephony into what we know today as smartphones, okay? This was 1992. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology was licensed to a number of different manufacturers and a lot of those technologies, including a lot of the voice recognition, is what you start seeing in the, uh, the products today. So 
while IBM was not the one that actually took them to market, that technology, the principles, the concepts, the patents associated with that were revolutionary. So the Dragon Dictation and all the other Siri and everything else stemmed from your work, IBM's work in 1990s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the team that you were working on with the PC. Do you um, want to talk about who those team members were? Do sure. you can can you talk about them? <laughs> sure. Actually, it was one of the wildest teams that uh, that I've ever been associated with it because it, it was young, it was energetic, they were as brilliant as they could be, and they were Larry Phillips, they were Terry Ellis, they were Gary Vanesky, they were Pedro del Sol. And what was common to all of them was the, the, the youth, the innovation, the I can do this thing, and not knowing that it couldn't be done. There were no limits to this group. And we, we worked together, we partied together, and we had a lot of fun doing both. There were some wild times in the laboratory. Third shift work was a riot. And everybody just kept very much their cool and had a spectacular time doing it. And when the product came out, there was no question it was gonna be a great product because there were some great people that worked on it. But then we went on out and partied together. It was very much of a family. Okay. Now we've talked about um, the global impact and I wanna bring it back a little bit locally. Mm -hmm. What would you say was IBM, the corporation's impact on Boca Raton specifically when, I guess from when you came up until the time when you left IBM? Mm -hmm. Yeah, back in 1976 uh, or 75 when I started, IBM was a small presence in Boca Raton. The buildings were large, but the footprint was it lacked definition. Uh, a lot of people said there's some smart people working those buildings, we don't know what they do. Okay? The personal computer was probably the most impactful thing that happened because people could recognize and identify with the product. It was no longer a mainframe that happens to be sitting in the government location, hiding and you know, all secretive. We exposed to the world what it is that we do. It caused a number of different um, phenomenons to happen within Boca Raton. First, it was the growth. We literally had to hire 10,000 people over a two-year span. We had numbers of people migrating from other IBM sites, plus people off the street that we took, and then that. That was a massive challenge because you literally had to screen people for tremendous responsibility that you were going to give them. So the growth and the ability to Boca Raton, for Boca Raton to actually absorb that many people in such a period of time, it was a challenge to our education system, to our retail systems, to our governmental systems, to our housing systems, all of the above. And God bless this community because they did it without a hitch and everybody was very, very proud of the community. The second one was the intellectual impact on the community because all of a sudden you brought some very, very high tech individuals that had tremendous educational background and a very strong perspective on technology. And they and their kids were now going to our schools and they just lifted the overall uh, intellectual capability of, of the community itself. And the third is IBM as a player in the community, in the society itself. IBM goes out of their way to become an integrated member of the society. The participation in community affairs, in social affairs, in a lot of the nonprofits, the charities, the churches, the educational programs, the schools, and everything else. It was massive, the amount of volunteer work, the amount of integration, how much time we spent with the kids in the community, how much time we spent with the underprivileged in the community, and it was, uh, second nature to us. It's, it, you do it because you are part of the community. And IBM actually encouraged it, IBM endorsed it, and 
it was a a great feeling because you were completely immersed in the in the community it wasn't what do those people do it was hey you know we see each other in the supermarket and people say oh yeah you know pete and you know here's here are the things that we're working on and people could identify with you so the personal computer had a very interesting point of inflection with the community because it's the first time people understood what it is that we were working on okay um, now, do you see how, how the Boca Raton area impacted or influenced IBM in any way? So kind of a vice versa look. Yeah, the, the impact on the uh, Boca into IBM, it gives a very, very unique perspective. Uh, the, the lifestyle. This is a very different lifestyle from Poughkeepsie, New York, <laughs> and we greatly appreciated it because, or Miami, or Miami. Uh, it was very unique. Where you have the the better um, uh, technologies and the better talent and education, but you had the beach two minutes away. You had the opportunity to play in the tennis league, in the softball league, in the football league, in your own backyard. You could leave work and literally play in, uh, and become part of the, uh, the society in those ways. So I think the, the lifestyle element was probably one of the more uh, influential ones that separated from any other site that IBM had. If you look at the larger sites that IBM has, Fishkill, New York, Endicott, New York, Burlington, Vermont, Rochester, Minnesota. They keep getting worse and worse. <laughs> but, you know, they, there are people that live there and enjoy it and everything else. The people that settled here, actually very few left. When IBM started going through some of the transitions and relocating some of the folks, the number of people that stayed because they li literally love the lifestyle. They loved the community, they loved the roots that they had put in here, they loved that their kids were still here. So it was a very, very uh, interesting time. So your question about what impact did Boca have on IBM? The lifestyle, no question. The facilities, the, the, the nature all around us. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, when we were off the recorder about 33 buildings mm -hmm. that IBM built to sustain this influx of individuals and products. Were you a part of that or, um, you know, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The expansion. Yeah, because of the, the, the personal computer, there were buildings that were built primarily for manufacturing because it was a warehouse type that you actually literally put the manufacturing line in and go to work. The other one, which was more office type, we just leased just about every building that we could find. There was a store over here on uh, Federal Highway called Brits. Brits was in what is now Meisner Park. Brits went out of business. We leased that building, and actually a two-story building with an escalator and everything else, so for escalations, <laughs> we did it. But the old Army-Navy building, the old uh, place in the fountains, all over the place. So it was a very distributed campus, and we just took any building that we could because we needed to house 10,000 people in a very short period of time. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. We talked about um, how the PC revolutionized. What about any future applications that you see might be coming out of any projects from IBM while you were there? Uh, one of the more significant ones that I had uh, the opportunity to work on uh, late in my career was the usage of supercomputers to actually go into the, the life sciences to understand how the body works. One of the f more fascinating projects that I had the opportunity to lead was usage of IBM's blue gene technology, the supercomputer, to actually model the mutations of the bird flu. Now think of the H5N1 and the phenomenon that occurs. It is a virus that is constantly mutating so by the time you figure out what it is, it's already changed. So 
what we were doing was using supercomputing technology to take a living organism, change it to a set of mathematical equations, run a bazillion possibilities of what are the more likely mutations from there, and then create, again, a living organism based on a mathematical equation. From there, you would create the antibody, antivirus, and then when and if it manifested itself somewhere around the world, you could nail it. That was called Project Checkmate because we were playing chess against a virus. That led to some f incredibly science that was developed, and actually that was done in partnership with our good friends at Scripps. It was the first relationship between Scripps and IBM, and one that we developed once we had brought our friends, partners from Scripps that landed here in our own backyard. We said, what is it that we should be doing to stress our best common, best minds, and the best technologies? So that was one. It was a very relevant uh, point in time because it was a, a worldwide epidemic, pandemic, that we were staring at. So it led to the creation of some very, very sophisticated technology. Now, if you look at the usage of supercomputers now related to this, you're looking at the Watson supercomputer, the one that played Jeopardy, mm -hmm. now going into health applications, taking massive amounts of data and running incredible analytics to determine the causes, the trends, the, the, the unique differences between uh, genomic, lifestyle, and environmental situations so that you can isolate very, very strong patterns that no doctor, no scientist, no wet lab, no petri dish, no mice, no monkey could possibly figure out. So probably the most exciting uh, development is going to be for the first time we'll understand how the body works through data. A lot of the data now in, in healthcare is becoming electronic. So it was going to go through a transformation. The moment we have an electronic form, we can do magic with it. Unfortunately, 90% of the data in, in healthcare, patient records, are phone, paper, and fax. So that's going to change. The moment it changes, we're going to see a major, major transformation. And both personal computer type, uh, smartphone types, but supercomputers will play a massive role in this. How long do you think that will be? It's happening. The, uh, the first application for Watson in the healthcare arena was uh, to a company called WellPoint. Now they happen to be an insurance company and they're working primarily with claims information, not real clinical information. But the moment we start loading it up with uh, clinical information and vitals and genomic information, this will be uh, earth changing. So, we're looking at a very short period of time. Within the next 10 years, you're going to see some miracles starting to, to happen. The first is the decoding of the, the human sequence or the genomic structure. The moment that happens now, we're going to be able to determine what's the architecture of the body. Right now, we've been treating symptoms. And it's best on, well, try this and try that. So it's trial and error. The moment we actually understand the inner workings of the architecture of the body and that everybody is different and that the way we react to different stimulus, whether it be environmental or chemical, is completely different between two bodies, we're going to be able to personalize health. We're going to be able to personalize medicine. We're going to be able to personalize a variety of different things, ultimately provide better health at a lower cost. So it's happening. It's, it's already happening. The main thing that we need now is data in electronic form. So um, it's interesting, very interesting. This applies to what you're doing now then? Correct. Okay. Um, so you were part of the downsizing for IBM in the 1990s, or did you? Mm -hmm. No? No. Okay. Um, but I can talk to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I would like for you to uh, um, talk about how, what, what happened at IBM when the downsize was announced um, and the impact on the people who were there and um, 
how that kind of spread out to not only to IBM but into Boca as well too. Sure. Uh, first is the understanding of why the downsizing happened. Uh, right in the middle of the heyday of the growth of the personal computer, the state of Florida, and specifically Governor Graham at the time, decides to impose a unitary tax on exports. Now, we were doing worldwide manufacturing from Boca Raton. So imagine in an industry where it has very small margins, you are being double taxed. Ain't going to happen. So the moment that passed, it just rang up through the halls in Armonk, New York, that something in the heart of PC land smells bad. Okay? This is classic government, government intervention in an area that absolutely has no business being into. So the moment that happened, it sent a message to both uh, our executives here. It says, we cannot live as a corporation with such government intervention. So the first thing that happened was other sites, Raleigh specifically, started coming in and said, well, we don't have a unitary tax and our cost of labor is actually just as low as you have in Florida. Why don't you look at bringing manufacturing up here? So the moment they saw that the knees buckled here, it left it wide open. So the first thing that went was actually manufacturing. And it was just a point of different sites negotiating to see who could actually offer a, a lower cost and, and and Raleigh did a superb job of that. But our needs were weakened by our own government. Okay. IBM had also bought a very large property up in Ocala. That was going to be a second massive site for, for IBM. Okay. Immediately sold that property. Very few people know about that, but that's the first thing that went. The second one was a bleeding out of some of the more critical elements. The first was manufacturing. Four years after manufacturing, three years after manufacturing went, then they said, well, you know, manufacturing should not be separate from engineering, from development. Why don't you bring the development team here? And why don't we put the software group in another software group in, in Austin, Texas? So it was a slow, very, very tedious and painful exercise that did not need to happen. Okay? Now, the impact on the people. Some people said, hey, tremendous opportunity. We moved with IBM a bunch of times. Uh, relocation is not a big thing. And they just went. They packed up and they got some tremendous jobs in, uh, in Raleigh and Austin and everything else. Some actually decided to stay, and they were offered some packages to leave the company, and they started their own companies. You see them all around. I mean, there are a massive number of, of companies that were started by ex-IBMers. And then others of us actually created different opportunities for ourselves. Personally, I said, what is it that I can do in relationship to IBM's growth and by the way, my family and my roots are very dug into Boca Raton. Where can I, what type of position? I saw IBM getting into the services business, into consulting. I said, well, based on some of my learnings from being in the uh, internet division, what if we created a business related to the internet, consulting to other companies related to the internet? This was 1994. And I went to the head of IBM's consulting business and said, hey, this internet thing, you know, I think every business is about to go through this thing. We can probably help them along the way, make some more, some more, some money for IBM. The guy said, um, put a proposal together, get yourself a couple of clients, and if they bite, you're in business. That's actually what became e-business consulting for IBM. That's actually what became and got IBM into strategy consulting. I was able to create an industry for IBM primarily based on the previous backgrounds in both the personal computer and the internet and the entrepreneurial spirit that was developed off of those. In a traditional way where it's, it's very much mainstream and you got to do the things by the numbers, nobody would think out of the box to get into a strategy consulting business. It was a market that was already with the top five at that time, you know, Price Waterhouse and Anderson. And, and, you know, here we were and we we're creating a market. Now IBM is the largest services company in the world. We redefined ourselves. Uh, if you look at the population in Boca, 
more than 50% of the employees are actually in the services business. They're either in outsourcing or IT or consulting or a variety of different things. So some of us that stay actually redefine ourselves, retool, mm -hmm. Pete 2.0. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it became a, a fascinating um, set of new opportunities. Okay? So when I retired from IBM uh, after 32 years, it was a marvelous career in the sense that it had to the opportunity to work on four things that didn't exist and had never been even conceived of. The, the first was the personal computer. Mm -hmm. The second one is the internet. I was on the ground floor of when we took the internet to become a commercial tool, which was called e-business. The third, creating a strategy consulting based off of that new platform called the, uh, the, um, the internet. And the fourth was the usage of supercomputers for health and, and life sciences. What a marvelous, what a marvelous set of opportunities that, you know, I've taken full advantage of it and, you know, now in, in my next episode of my life, I'm leveraging all of those to, you know, create a, a better environment in Boca Raton. <laughs> okay. Um, well, that concludes all the questions I have for you. Did you have anything in specific that you wanted to record for historical purposes about IBM and your experience there? Sure. It's, it's a point of gratitude to the city of Boca Raton. And while a lot of people uh, say it, I lived it. I absolutely lived it from 1975 to this point in time. And it is my home. But more than my home, it is a place that I had the opportunity to grow professionally, grow my family, grow with the community itself. And it is a, a tremendous testament to the, the openness of this community to work with the, the better professionals to actually attract business and more importantly, to, to flourish, the, 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 the permissiveness of, of flourishing in an innovative environment, that's not very common to all, all uh, uh, societies. Uh, this is a high, high quality, high intellectual, high work ethic environment with a very strong professional uh, sense. Uh, that's a rare combination. And uh, I've had the opportunity to, uh, to live the dream. So uh, incredibly grateful on behalf of myself and IBM. Well, I thank you for the time that you've taken today to be with us. Um, this concludes the interview. Thank you.